Okay guys, welcome back to the channel. Got a special treat for you today. It's a video Zoom interview with the CEO and designer of Eri Surratt gear, Stavros Danos. And he doesn't do very many interviews, although I'll link one in the description that was very detailed, more conducive to a written, something you can read about if you really want to dive into the details. Now we went into very extensive details in this interview, and it's probably going to be two parts because we covered a lot of stuff. Uh, but for those that are really interested, I'll link that for you as well, because I think this is a company that's worth learning a lot more about if you're interested and have the budget for this type of gear. Like I like to do on my channel, when I do these Zoom interviews, I like to bring to attention brands like SMC Audio, uh, Estelon, I did an interview with um, Alyssa, brands that aren't that well known but are doing very innovative things and providing some value in each of their respective disciplines that I think you guys should know about and bring you along for the ride as well as I learn more. And with Ari Sarad, I wanted to do this little preface video because it's a macro point I wanted to make in terms of sometimes your initial perceptions are wrong. <laughs> like when I walked into the uh, Axpona room for Ari Sarat, that was probably the room I ended up spending the most time with. And people at the end of the show were t talking about me as Mr. Ari Sarat because I spent so much video content on that. But when I first walked in, I did not have a good impression of what was going on there. I looked at that speaker and I was like, how could this possibly work? What the hell? Uh, I've never seen anything like it. And you tend to just have your biases and dogmas already against something that you're not used to seeing. But then when you sit down and you objectively listen and then you hear, oh, wow, okay, it is working. And then you learn the base driver configuration is there for a reason that unique dipole-ish open baffle you're going to hear why he does that and then you're going to be wondering like probably like me why all people aren't doing it that way and aligning it all in one cabinet on top of the being able to see and see that horn having the resources that five axis cnc machine and other tools you're going to hear about that nobody else has in the industry or at least none that i know about that's another big part. You can have all the brains in the world, but if you can't implement your designs because of restriction on tools and resources, Harry Surratt doesn't have that, and most people don't know that. This is a company with major resources, major tools to create things that really nobody else can do. And they're using parts under the hood that it's not just advancing the hobby like a lot of brands are with fancier heat sinks and gauges and very just minor changes under the hood. Things that they're doing under the hood are going to be very innovative for those that are technical oriented when you hear this inverted triode, triode fat, the variability to change the bias for tube rollers. This is a heaven made product. Not only can you quasi change tube roll with the existing stock tubes with that tube bias, but when you do change tubes that have different characteristics, now you have a bias changing easy mechanism for um, for further optimizing things. And then they think of everything, like I said, from aesthetics all the way through. If you're in the ecosystem of Ari Surratt, tremendous advantages you're gonna hear about. But they also think about, if you're gonna be mating their pieces with others, they have the tools and the adjustments necessary to still get optimal performance. So thinking that far out of the box for every little thing from aesthetics, and again, the speaker, aesthetic-wise, that paint finish you're gonna hear about, proprietary to them and it's the best I've ever seen most unique and definitely worth seeing firsthand if you get a chance but let me not spoil everything I just want to give you that heads up that don't let your initial impression sometimes color your thing my intuition to learn more turned out to be super justified and this is a great company I uh, hope you enjoy the interview if you are interested in getting home auditions and learning more and potentially buying this gear hopefully there's a dealer nearby you but if not you're welcome to email me and i can put you in touch with these guys let me just tell you in advance though this is not a brand for tire kickers you have to have a significant budget um and the value is actually pretty good compared to others that i've seen cost a lot more that don't have all these tools and resources and r d and under the hood but in any case and it's not gear you can see like i said flippers or at deep discounts this is gonna be stuff that you're gonna probably pay retail for. But if you are serious uh, and wanna get in touch with these guys, feel free to email me. They'll at least know you watch probably my videos and know a little bit about the company uh, to give you a little bit of street cred with them when you're talking. So, but without further ado, let's get to the interview and uh, it'll probably be two parts, so stay tuned. All right, so anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Um, welcome back to the channel. Got a special treat today. We're doing a 
what, what looks like a karaoke choir Zoom, <laughs> but actually it's a very special Zoom. This is an interview with Stavros Danos of Ari Surratt, as well as the distributor and Robert, who I formerly visited last a uh, couple weeks ago. So don't want to, it's, it's a brand that has attracted my attention more than just about any other brand recently. So wanted to get some more information for myself and also for you guys. So without further ado, let's go into a few introductions. Bob? Yes, my name is Robert Neal. I'm uh, the owner of Worldwide Wholesales. We distribute several uh, very high-end manufacturers in North America. And uh, we're definitely um, extremely fortunate to work with Arias Surratt. Stavros Danos, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes, uh, that's actually a good uh, pronunciation if you're not a Greek. <laughs> so okay. uh, it's Stavros. And you're in Cyprus, is that correct? Correct, yes, in uh, Eastern Mediterranean. Okay. Yeah, assuming that most people, I've done a lot of research on you, I've been very impressed and definitely would like to dive into details, but if you could just give a general overview of your background and what was the genesis of Harry Surratt. So back in uh, 2010, uh, we started initially as a uh, mainly focused on speaker manufacturing, designing, uh, researching and developing of speakers. Um, starting back then, I remember uh, giving a lot of focus in establishing uh, manufacturing basing. We acquired a very elaborate CNC uh, workstations. Uh, we make custom uh, machinery for uh, uh, the lab shop. So it was a mostly focused on speakers uh, manufacturing. And on process, we I realized that uh, the, the electronics out there, let's say of the audio file variety, or in professional variety, they were not good enough, at least in my years, to develop what I had in mind in speakers. So I started early on developing my own electronics, uh, not focused as commercial items. They were mostly cost no object items. And how I usually design is I, I, I always scrap all prior art and start from scratch. I always start from blank. I say, okay, this is the problem, how I approach it. I don't care, you know, what's been done. Maybe you can uh, go backwards and see if you have no conflicts, but this is how, uh, you know, my thought process is. So I started building electronics, our amplifiers, preamps, special resources uh, as a lab tool to develop our uh, speakers. For example, uh, our first stack was like a refrigerator sized uh, Duck, which was named uh, just Cassandra, <laughs> which mm. the Cassandra two series uh, spawned out of. Uh, same with the amplifiers; it was like a big trunk of an amplifier because they were designed as a lab instrument, not as a commercial design. So I spared no uh, cost on the developing of the parts. We went, uh, you know, crazy in ideas because we did not have commercialization of the idea in mind. Uh, and while the speaker development went forward, it, it delayed for a couple of years. So I said, okay, let's go to an exhibition with just electronics. They're not going to be commercialized, but let's put them in a box and go to shows. And um, uh, you know, the crowd reaction was immense. They, uh, they loved electronics. So we said, okay, let's, let's try to put some of our ideas into boxes and then just start the electronics brand. So that's how it started. The oxymoron was that by the time we launched uh, the Siphonia speakers back in 2014, we already had like 10 models of electronics. So it was kind of oxymoron that we started a speaker company, but by the time the first model came out, we were full. We had uh, three models of amps, preamps, sources. So it was like a backward, way into uh, electronics, um, audio electronics and audio speakers afterwards. That's the, in short, how the company started back in 2010. Yeah, I wanted to just pick up on one thing you said. I, I don't think it, people realize how rare it is to have, I think you have a five axis CNC machine, is that correct? Yeah, yeah it's not just a five axis, the envelope, the working envelope of that machine is probably uh, very few in, in Europe alone. Uh, they were actually designed to work on, uh, it's actually designed in the US and uh, it's actually designed to work on space frames for aircrafts, for uh, for that kind of, it has a very large Z envelope. 
and I specifically asked for this machine um, to be uh, so we can make some very elaborate shapes which were not possible to be manufactured out of wood before. Usually they would be like uh, uh, either not possible or required 3D printing, but not at this size, or uh, let's say some uh, additive manufacturing. So I tried to be okay, how if I design this, how we manufacture this, we found these uh, machines back in the US. We had a lot of uh, bureaucracy to import them as they are, um, the technology is a bit restricted. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're very lucky to have that uh, in our portfolio because it, it expanded um, our way in the process of thinking uh, ten, 10 times more because it's different to think of an idea and it's different to say, okay, that's not possible. Let's grab this and move on. With this machine, I was like, okay, this is the design. Tomorrow we'll start building it. So it, it accelerated the design process by um, a number of times, I think. So yeah, it, I don't think people realize there's a lot of smart people in the world and a lot of smart people in the audiophile industry and speaker designers, but sometimes your limits are on the tools that you have at your disposal to make what you can envision. And the, that's what really stood out to me is not only do you have that innovative thinking and design and expertise, but you also have the tools that allow you to implement something. And I think that is probably a large part of the newest speaker, the Aurora, you being able to do that horn in a special way. I think maybe we could talk about that because that captured my attention the most at Expona. Maybe we can talk about the speaker first in a little more detail. Of course, uh, it, it, when you have, let's say, a new tool in your uh, in your portfolio, or let's say, in the back of your mind, when you design something, uh, it opens up possibilities. Even unconsciously, you you know that if I design this, I can make it. So it opens a, a lot of uh, different paths of thinking how to solve some issues. Same for Aurora, for example, the latest of our horns. Uh, I tried to think. Okay, how in, in theory, how do you go from a round horn to a rectangle uh, enclosure while uh, minimizing or near zero diffraction? So the only way mathematically to do that is this square type of um, back, uh, rollback. But if you, if you don't have the tools to make it, then your mind is just pushing that idea out, you know, back, if, even if you don't, if you have the idea. So if you have the idea, and you immediately know that, you know, I can design this in a couple of days and we start manufacturing the, in, in two days. Measure it, it's very different process than uh, going blindly into manufacturing process and not having any idea how to do, um, you know, how to implement your ideas. Yeah, it's well, and I can say firsthand, it pays off in terms of the sound. I was extremely impressed, not even being a huge horn guy previously, uh, definitely does not suffer from the normal horn things that I found problematic in the past. So kudos to you on that. And now while we're on the speaker, though, the other thing that really jumped out to me probably equally was your unique bass configuration, kind of a dipole-ish but open baffle combination. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So the idea, I'm mostly a horn guy. So my, uh, you know, my usual route on bass is uh, bass horns. Uh, we are, um, uh, let's say, I, I dare to say, a bit of a specialist in bass horns. We developed some very, very special bass horns for the bigger Condendo. Uh, but for this speaker, I wanted to do something different uh, in terms of size, um, positioning in the room, being more flexible in positioning and being much more forward in, in manufacturing. Because if you want to do a bass horn correctly, it's going to be big, heavy, uh, gonna, and especially the way we do it with stack ply, it will take some months to make. So I said, okay, if you're gonna do a bus on the side, what can you do? And um, what I like and don't like in open baffle design is that they lack the impact that a bus on carries. So I tried to see, okay, how can you approach this, you know, this um, impact wave of the bus horn to this design? So I tried to roll it back uh, so it was a gradual uh, design, this cube. As, as, at first I said, okay, let's roll it back and make the uh, back opening much smaller than the uh, displacement, let's say, the, the area of the cones. The, that's, uh, the, uh, that way you can create 
back pressure under certain frequency, which the open baffle speaker cannot create. They cannot create back pressure. They can only create uh, velocity waves. So with the rollback and with the restriction in the back, we are able to make back pressure. So we leave aside that one. And then um, the, the old direction firing of the woofers means that, especially on the sides, means that you can uh, make a uniform lowering of the room. So the four woofers act like a, a virtual single driver, which the center of the woofer is the center of the cube. So it's like having a, a big, um, let's say, sphere, spherical uh, driver with the center, the acoustic center in the center of the cube. Now, this uh, gives another uh, advantage. Uh, it means that you can actually align the, the horn with the woofers and coincide the same space, which is not possible to do otherwise. So it's like having two drivers at the same space. Uh, so the, the start of the horn is at the center of the cube, for example, right. which means it's at the center of the, of the woofers. So automatically you are time aligned. Hmm. Uh, and leaving that aside, what you, uh, also another problem with conventional woofers is uh, the boundary, the first, the first boundary you have, let's say from the side walls or the back walls, it will create some nulls and peaks in the response. If you have these four woofers firing in 45 degrees, uh, in, in, on vertical and horizontal, the lowering, especially near boundaries, is, is much more uniform. So the peaks and, and dips will even out. So uh, you have much more, um, uh, let's say, uh, less problems in terms of modes of the room uh, in nulls and uh, peaks. So it's like a side effect, but not by, by accident. It was, again, a part of the design process. Uh, the good thing with the, is this that we, we we tick a lot of boxes with this design. Uh, it uh, required some um, conduring in the response. That's why we went into uh, semi-active configuration. But it really paid off, in my opinion. If you cannot go huge bass horns, you know, uh, two and a half meter high and two ton bass horns, that's that's the next best thing, in my opinion. The configuration of the Aurora. Yeah, it's amazing. I, when I walked into the room and I first saw that design being so unique, I was like, how could this possibly work? Because I've never seen it before. And you think everybody's tried everything before. And now I'm at the point where I'm wondering, why hasn't anybody else done this? It just seems to make so much sense, both in listening and now how you explain it. Um, and actually, there's even one more part of the speaker we haven't talked Well, actually, the crossover as well. But the tweeter, too, is pretty... Uh, atypical. I've never seen the raw ribbon done in that um, angle. And is that because of the dispersion characteristic trying to mitigate the horizontal versus vertical? Or can you elaborate? That's another good point. The uh, first of the ribbon is a true uh, foil ribbon. So it doesn't have a carrier. It's very light. It's about eight micrograms. Very, very light, very fast. Uh, it's custom made by RAL. And it's designed to be um, work as a dipole, but the front wave is horn loaded, so it uh, it's not symmetrical in the radiation pattern. In front, it's about 4 dB higher in sensitivity, uh, and it also has the dynamics, which some people will say the ribbons lack. Uh, they have all this re finesse and refinement, and lack of breakup. You know, they can go up to more than 100 k without any breakups. Um, because of the nature of the foil, uh, but they lack a little bit of punch, so they cannot really match a horn unless you horn loaded the ribbon with a proper horn. Um, now, the 45 degree angle, you might say it's aesthetic, but it's not. Um, what I try to do is to avoid uh, what, what I call um, crosstalk reflections. So, uh, crosstalk uh, reflections is the, the reflections you have. Uh, from the left wall, from the right, uh, from the right speaker, and from the right wall, from the left speaker. So it's like crossing the reflections back to you. So this uh, really, really distorts your ambience and your uh, localization um, to get proper imaging. Although you can argue that imaging is fake in studio, but uh, not always. So uh, you can really cancel out the accuracy if you have this cross talk reflection. So what I've tried to do is that. Um, having in mind that 
the longer the ribbon, it has a very narrow um, dispersion on its vertical axis. So it's like shooting, it's like a laser uh, shooting in the vertical, but quite wide um, on the horizontal. So flipping it 45 degrees, what you have is that the reflections on the, uh, on the cube from the big, from the wide uh, horiz uh, horizontal reflections will shoot to the ceiling. The, uh, so, but the, the very narrow dispersion on the, on the vertical axis of the Twitter, which is now 45 degrees, will mean that you'll have very few reflections from the left speaker to the right wall and vice versa. Hmm. So you really focus uh, what's actually true information to the listener, especially if you, t if you tow in the speakers very, very aggressively. Uh, then sitting in the front, uh, just is like a, a light switch coming out. So uh, as soon as you're in center, it's like oh, and a window opens up. That's where there is actually true time align, uh, the speaker. And uh, having in mind that you have very few reflections, uh, especially from opposite walls, you get this immense uh, sound stage, both, both in depth and, uh, and, and actually whiteness. Even if you have them aggressively towed in, uh, it creates some very holographic and quite wide uh, imaging. Yeah, I noticed that at, at Robert's house, in fact. And I think because he had them a little bit set up different or the listening positions were different from Expona, we could get right on axis at Robert's house. And yeah, I noticed this super wide soundstage, which I only previously heard with uh, Polk SDA technology, which also does that interaural crosstalk cancellation in a different way than what you're doing. But yeah, it cre creates just an immersive wide soundstage. And the way you've done that tweeter is kind of brilliant, just like the, the uh, woofer configuration. Um, so that's super interesting and pays off again in the sound. But there's even more creativeness, I guess, in the crossover. I wanted to talk to you more about that, the external crossover box. You do power the woofers uh, with some amplification. We could talk about that. Right. But also your crossover, I think you had mentioned you did, were able to achieve a achieve a zero group delay with your crossover. Maybe talking about that and also the customization through the Bluetooth app. Of course, uh, let's start with the, with the filters. They are not zero group delay. You cannot have group zero. You have constant, which means linear. Okay. So uh, what happens is that the group delay changes, varies. It's the second derivative of the response. So in the, in the stop band, uh, the group delay changes in value. So uh, even if they are aligned, the drivers in some frequencies, they will be misaligned because of the, uh, the variance in the group delay. So what you try to do is you maximize the linearity of the group delay. No, so you don't have to have zero value, which is impossible or a certain value, you try to linearize. Okay. So what we do is we shape um, the response and this in the stop band slopes. So we change the rate of slopes in, in the way that the group delay is as linear as possible. So when you real time align them, we have some proprietary uh, software and some techniques which we uh, align the drivers, not just the diaphragms, but true time alignment. Um, then in, uh, while you have the maximum linearity in the group delay, that means you are time aligned in most of the frequency range of the driver and in the stop band as well. So. It's very important that you linearize the group delay, not in absolute value, but to be as linear, not just in the pass band, but also in the stop band, which is, in my opinion, the most important uh, because of the overlap with the other drivers. So that's okay. how the constant group delay filters work. Now, another point is the Bluetooth. Once somebody hears Bluetooth, he'll say digital, DSP, <laughs> right. uh, maybe in the dark something is going on. Uh, it actually, the other way around, this is pu purely passive. So imagine, let's say that you want to change your mid-range response and the slopes or the power band. So what you do is we have a, a number of passive components and transformers in, um, in the crossover box, which are controlled by relays and the relays are controlled by the Bluetooth application. So everything is made in passive mode, not even active mode. So there are no buffers inside. Uh, no DSPs, no conversion made. So imagine having a multiple set of filters for each driver 
which you can select them uh, with the use of relays in real time in your listening chair, uh, which was one of the reasons how the speaker was um, being able to play in Axpona, which was like a 15 square meter room or so. It could play in Munich fantastically, which was a 70 square meter room. And it plays fantastic in our room, which is 400 square meters. Okay. And you can do this. No speaker can play perfect in all spaces, um, but you can approach this with this uh, approach because you can you can change the power uh, level of the woofers mid range Twitter. Uh, you can change the power uh, band so you can make the the for example on the mid range you can not only change the level of the mid range you can change the mm -hmm. crossover slope you can change the power response um small details that when you know what you're doing with the application you can really transform uh the speaker in, in quite a way i'll give you an example we have uh, i was demonstrating and teaching a distributor of mine in munich and i showed him how that if you change even if you change position so go from near field from and far field of course you have different uh, your perceiving of the speaker, you can actually make it sound the same with the application. Uh, so it depends, not only changes depending on the size of the room, but your listening position as well. Um, it's very important to have this tool because not all speakers uh, can sound you know, the same in all on rooms. You will have a lot of parameters changing by even a slight uh, change in position. So you need these kind of tools. Yeah, and even the same room, depending on how much people put into room treatments or whatever uh, positioning and setup, it could sound totally different. So yeah, that's a great feature. And actually, I was speaking to somebody this weekend, looking at your speaker in particular and asking me how it would mate in a big family room off axis, you know, different size than what I've personally heard it at so far. So this is great information to share that there is some customization there. And kudos to you for giving that because very few speakers give you that level of passive control of the crossover, so. It's very important. And we try to avoid DSPs and, you know, uh, digital solutions. They have their own faults. So we try to avoid them as much as possible. Gotcha. I've got a quick question. Um, just uh, out of curiosity, what was the total length of time to design this speaker, Stavros? Uh, that's a good question. Now, if you say from day that I, I, I said, okay, let's go for it. And by the time you, you received the first speaker, uh, it was about a year and a half, uh, but the, um, it already had, let's say, cheating because we used some solutions from our previous speakers. So it was not, uh, let's say, blank sheet of, uh, of developing. Uh, for example, the Bluetooth application and, and module was developed uh, two years ago from the for the Contento speaker. So it was, let's say, a modification of that technology to be put in the Aurora. Um, so you can say the Aurora concept to export was about a year and a half, but it already had a lot of um, shared technology with previous models. So you, can, you cannot, let's say, uh, tell when it started. 